Okay. Um, the second talk today is a kennel class uh, create of a open framework for tree kennel pie uh, monitoring with uh, Owen Smith. Thanks, Owen. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Uh, Owen is a student of the Institute for Environmental and Spatial Data Analysis at the University of North Georgia. It's okay? Okay. Uh, Owen, uh, the stage is yours. I will you share your presentation. Uh, good luck and good presentation. Thank you. So uh, this work was um, initially uh, undertaken and completed uh, roughly two years ago while I was at the Institute for Environmental Spatial Analysis. Uh, and I recently just graduated there. And I'm now at uh, North Carolina State uh, pursuing my PhD in geospatial analytics. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I've learned a lot since then. Uh, and yeah, but uh, so this, this work came about um, with the completion of a contract for the Georgia Forestry Commission in which we were using um, proprietary software to create tree canopy uh, products for the entire state of Georgia using NAEP imagery. Um, there we go. So th they, they wanted to, to know a lot about the deforestation metrics in the in the state, uh, especially as Georgia uh, within the United States is growing rapidly, uh, urban sprawl is a huge issue. Um, and naturally with that comes a lot of uh, deforestation uh, and the different uh, environmental factors that are caused by it. Um, and so we go into a little bit about deforestation here and the small scales and even at the large scales of what I can do. And then they, they wanted to be able to monitor it, however, we didn't have a ton of resources. Uh, ideally, we would have some sort of uh, access to cloud compute uh, to have real-time monitoring systems set up um, to be able to update. Uh, and then with that, we we were using Textron's feature analyst, uh, which in licenses are expensive. So Dr. Cho, Hide Cho and I at the University of North Georgia, we were thinking, well, can we do this with open source software? Uh, and so we did. Uh, and so the previous studies, as I mentioned, uh, the Georgia Forestry Commission, which was undertaken by us, uh, and then others have used PyTorch, uh, Keras, TensorFlow, or Feo Toolbox and the likes. Um, so the imagery used for this uh, was the National Agricultural Imagery Program, otherwise known as NAEP imagery. Uh, it's collected by the USDA every three, four years, give or take. And then it traditionally has been at a one meter resolution. However, after 2019, it's now at a 0 0.6 meter resolution. And they offer it in two, in two formats. They offer it in three band, just standard RGB, and then additionally a four band uh, product, which has the near infrared band. And it has a really exceptional uh, pre processing quality. Uh, a lot of it's flown um, from airplanes. So hence the, the high resolution um, and they remove cloud cover for us. Um, so there, there's, there's really no need for a cloud mask oftentimes, uh, which helps with the processing because it's an extra step that doesn't need to be done. So the Python libraries that were used in this um, were GDAL, obviously, as, as I'm sure everybody attending this conference uh, knows GDAL, and then NumPy, which is the kind of fundamental uh, computing library uh, for science in Python, that in addition to SciPy. Um, and then GDAL uh, utilizes NumPy really heavily for its abstraction into Python. And then additionally, scikit-learn, uh, which Charlotte gave a great overview of, uh, utilizes NumPy as well really heavily. It's all implemented in NumPy. Um, and then onto that, scikit-learn, um, it, it's, it's pretty much the go-to um, for Python machine learning. Uh, again, it's built on top of NumPy and SciPy, the, the uh, sort of premier Python scientific computing libraries. Um, and then, but why scikit? Because I mentioned uh, other other libraries such as PyTorch and Keras earlier. And the reason for that is 
a lot of these packages use artificial neural networks pretty extensively. And then they additionally use these for um, processing along GPU units. Well, at the time uh, that this was conducted, uh, they had really limited AMD GPU support and I didn't have access to any other uh, type of GPU. So I was, I was pretty limited with that. Um, so ultimately we were uh, CPU um, confined. Uh, so we wanted something that was able to, to split uh, parallel across CPU and, and Scikit does that really well with in particular their random forest classifier. Um, and then since Scikit is, is built uh, on top of NumPy and GDAL uses NumPy extensively, they integrate really well together um, for any sort of remote sensing classification that's needed. So onto the algorithm then. So we use we we decided to use random forests um, and Charlie gave a really great overview of that as well. Um, and so the reasons for choosing this over other things such as neural networks or support vector machines was that uh, random forest has been found to be very useful in land cover classification. It is uh, has a has a good split of both time and accuracy. Um, as a lighter load computationally than say the Ada boost algorithm. Um, and again, it can be parallelized across the CPU, uh, which is incredibly useful, uh, especially as A, we didn't have access to any sort of GPU that, that was able to, to be utilized for this uh, in the Python environment. And B, it becomes incredibly useful if used in a high performance computing environment where primarily you're working across CPU cores. Um, one consideration though, is it, it can be a memory hog, uh, especially as the, as the matrix of number samples by the number of trees is stored in the memory. Um, so this also becomes important, right? Because because we're working with one meter and 0 0.6 meter resolution imagery. And then, so we also explored the extra trees classifier. Um, so like random forest, it's a multi-tree predictor built using an ensemble of decision trees. Uh, class, the, this classifier splits the nodes of the tree completely at random. Uh, it uses the entirety of the sample and not just a bootstrap to grow trees. Uh, this means that there's a, it's, each tree is independent or uncorrelated to the very last. Um, whereas oftentimes in random forest, you can get a um, some some correlated data in there. Um, and so again, we we went with this because it has a higher bias and lower variance than standard random forest, and it's suited for noisy or high, highly correlated data sets. Um, and, and the noise in particular was a big consideration um, due to the spatial resolution uh, of the data we were working with. So then with that, uh, we had to decide what we were going to uh, classify, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, the NAPE imagery comes in two products. We have the standard RGB product and then the RGB plus NIR product. Um, so with that, we wanted to test um, both. We, we wanted to see if using just pure RGB uh, was just as viable as the NIR um, index. So, so with that, we chose the visually atmospheric resistant index and the atmospheric resistant vegetation index. Um, so just for those who don't know, the, the near-infrared uh, is useful for vegetation remote sensing as it's absorbed by photosynthesis photosynthetically active vegetation and lesser by photosynthetically inactive vegetation uh, and is subsequently reflected by bodies of water and impervious surfaces. Uh, so quite useful, um, especially in Georgia uh, where we do have a growing urban sprawl um, and it becomes important to, to be able to separate that, right? Um, So the visually atmospheric resistant index uh, just uses only visible light bands, uh, potentially makes it more accessible, uh, more flexible in, in areas that, that don't have an NIR product available at a high resolution. Um, and so the 
The blue band is incorporated into both of the index I'm going to show, uh, and this adds kind of a uh, proxy, one could say, for the removal of atmospheric effects without um, any sort of higher level processing to remove that. Uh, so Ferrari formula, and then we also normalized it between the values one and negative one uh, for classification. And so these are just some examples uh, of the VARI, the normalized VARI, and the uh, ARVI, which is the NIR. You can see that the non-normalized uh, visually atmospheric resistance index uh, doesn't do quite a great job. Uh, the, the black uh, body you can see in the middle is a uh, is, is a waterway. Uh, th this, I believe, is a wetland area, so kind of a tricky area to classify as is. Um, but you can see the normalized safari a little bit better, but the, the RV is very clear that it becomes um, better at, at separating the, those values without um, any sort of, uh, say, ensemble method using uh, data fusion. Uh, and so then on to the atmospheric resistant index. Um, so as I mentioned, it uses the blue band uh, to, to simulate uh, the removal of atmospheric effects. Uh, it works very well. Uh, the, the literature was clear about that. Um, yeah, and, and that, as we show, that, so th that what the previous slide was a subset of this current image here. Um, you can see that even throughout it, that that water body throughout the wetland, it, it's very clear that it's separated. Uh, you can see the difference between farmland and even some spots within the wetland where there's forests potentially um, that, that are dying, uh, which is a whole other issue. So we also enacted uh, additional image processing steps uh, for our output, uh, just a simple local statistics uh, image processing, just a Gaussian 5x5 five five medium filter. Um, really fast as well, that was implemented with SciPy, um, so very negligible uh, computational uh, overhead added with this. And so the overall workflow uh, can be seen here. Um, so I, I've, I've spoken a lot about NAEP imagery and initially this product or this, this, this work was designed around specifically to enable classification on NAEP imagery for the entire state. Um, and so, but I, I wanted to try to make it as modular as possible to be used with any sort of remote sensing data. So on, on the bottom half of here, we have it set up to after pre-processing uh, you can use on individual files. Uh, in the top half, you see pre-processing, classification, then post-processing functions are included. But then th there's a whole suite of uh, functions and methods to enable uh, efficient processing of, of NAEP imagery. Um, and so from start to beginning, uh, you can input your configuration file parameters to, to hopefully make it more reproducible and include testing. Um, and then within this as well, I, I didn't mention this, um, but it also we, we utilized uh, scikit-learn's hyper uh, parameter tuning, uh, which utilizes a grid search. Um, and that's offered as well, kind of packaged for this specific use case um, to, to try to find the most efficient and uh, most efficient and most accurate. Uh, parameters for the remote, for the random forest classification. So then again, I've talked about Georgia. Um, for those who don't know, this is what Georgia looks like. Uh, it's where I was born and raised, and uh, it's where my family's from. So, so it's it's on the mind. Um, but we used it as our case study primarily because we were already working within it, and we had a, a existing data set that we had created using uh, a different software that we had already validated. Um, we already had all the raw data. Um, so it, it was, it, it kind of was natural to, to use this. Um, so we chose a couple uh, physiographic districts within the state. Uh, and again, I mentioned why Georgia is important. It has a very high biodiversity. Um, 
you can go from the coast to the southern Appalachians to farmland and between it to one of the most populated cities uh, in the world in Atlanta. Uh, so really varying uh, area. Uh, so challenging as well um, to, to create accurate data sets. So then we, we ran the workflow as I, uh, as I have gone over. Um, and, and a big thing for us was we wanted to, to look at the time um, of, what, of what was created compared to the existing. Um, th this was also relatively easy to do because again, we, we created this other data set in this additional, um, this additional proprietary software. Um, so you can see on the, the several graphs here um, that utilizing the, the pipeline set up from GDAL uh, to do all the, the pre-processing all the way through Scikit, all the way through the, the post-processing to the, to the smoothing, um, we, have a, we have a clear, very clear um, time advantage here. And it, it's important to know that Feature analysts, it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison uh, based on the algorithms. Feature analyst does use an ensemble method. So of course there'll be more processing steps within that. But again, if we can get uh, comparable results for less uh, in less time, then, then to me that is worth it. Um, so then here's just the times as well. Uh, these will be in minutes. Um, that's an important note. And you can see based on area and then uh, the times for each step, right? So we have the index creation um, very quite quick. And then we also ran extra trees and then the base rate and forest classifier for each and compared the times uh, to feature analysts. And so then beyond the, um, the, the out of bag uh, kind of metrics that scikit-learn, uh, provides for for uncertainty and accuracy analysis. Uh, we also wanted to, to to try to quantify it against our um, the the product we had already created with this other software. Um, so for that, we we implemented the moving window comparison coefficient in Python, uh, and it basically it. It's a spatially aware comparison index for categorical raster data sets. Um, so it, with that, we're, we're using categorical raster data sets. So it, it's, a, it's a prime example of, of how to use it and when to use it. Um, in simple, you can go more into the literature about that. Um, the, the paper, it was initially, um, it was initially created by uh, Robert Costanza in 1989. Uh, he has a great paper about that. Um, so here's just some examples. Um, so we, for this is just a selection of 20 tiles for comparison. Uh, and we, the, the mean uh, for extra trees was an 87.56 similarity uh, coefficient score. And then for random forest was an 87.62 similarity. Uh, and then in the top right, you can kind of see from beginning to end, you can see the, the raw data, um, the extra trees outputs, and then the feature analyst outputs. Uh, and you can see in that second column, one, one uh, thing that was noticed was that our pipeline performed better in areas of dense forests uh, than the other data set had uh, without any sort of post-processing. Um, which is really important to us as well. So, yeah. Um, so just some considerations. Uh, this was conducted about two years ago uh, while I was still an undergraduate. Um, so I had limited resources and time. Uh, this project uh, was, a, was a learning opportunity uh, for me as well. Um, so with with the sort of resources and technical skills I've learned since then, uh, I think the, the product would be more robust uh, than it currently is. Uh, and I, I would certainly try my hardest to make it more robust. So yeah, any questions? So uh, Owen, 
Great presentation. Uh, we have uh, uh, some questions here. I put it in the screen for Great. the first is uh, those only four bands are sufficient in your case. Yeah, so so that's a good question. That that was a discussion that that was had quite a bit. Um, because that, that is a trade off with Nape imagery, right? Because we can use moderate resolution imagery, say say Landsat or um, at the time HLS, the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data set wasn't quite as robust as as it is currently. Um, but we we wanted to have that that really fine scale spatial resolution um, classify with. Uh, so it's a trade off. Um, but the four bands, um, I, I believe, will be res will be um, sufficient uh, because oftentimes with vegetation sort of remote sensing, you're, you're going to be using the the NIR bands in anyways. So those will be your main um, wavelengths that you'll be looking at and analyzing. Um, if we wanted to do say more um, different feature extraction. Um, Say, say we wanted to potentially uh, be better at removing water, we, we could use the SWIR bands that, that say, um, uh, more moderate resolution imagery would have. Um, but now, uh, since then, uh, I, I think this would be a, a great uh, use case for, say, planet data, uh, which offers um, probably better wavelengths and more, um, more kind of, um, so what I'm looking for, uh, updated data, right? Because it's it's almost near daily uh, data for for that monitoring paradigm. Uh, but yes, four bands sufficient in this case. Okay, uh, we have a, another question. Uh, is possibility for extending the library to use in another biomass? Yeah, so so that's a good question. Um, I, I was focused uh, a lot on the state of Georgia because um, because that's where we we had the data for um, the NAPE imagery. I think it's approximately like thirty nine thousand data tiles. Um, so uh, I, the, there wasn't any sort of robust testing for other biomes. Um, Georgia itself has has. Um, has quite a few biomes. Uh, there was testing uh, in kind of uh, emergent wetland areas along the shores uh, within the inner city and then within the um, uh, foothills of the Appalachian Mountains and then the mountains themselves. Um, but there was no testing, say, in areas that perhaps would have snow. Um, and that's also a, a symptom of the, the nature of nape imagery. It's taken during the growing, se growing seasons. Um, so, so we weren't really able to test for any different, say, like snow masks or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a great question and a consideration for the future. Okay. So uh, if uh, we don't have another questions, uh, I uh, I say uh, a good presentation, and the people say in the chat uh, they love your presentation. So it's a very good okay. presentation. So uh, you, do we have uh, some minutes if you can say something or invite the people to know more about you, you, you working, uh, share your uh, contacts? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Hopefully, uh, a lot more work coming from me. I just started my um, PhD uh, this this past uh, month or so uh, at the University of North Carolina, uh, or no, North Carolina State. Don't don't tell North Carolina State. I just said University of North Carolina. Um, but yeah, but you can find me. Uh, my my you can email me at my email. Um, I'm on GitHub. Uh, my username is OC Smith. Um, I fairly active with the grass community as well. Um, so looking forward to contributions there. Uh, yeah. OK, thanks, Owen. Uh, great presentation. See you soon in Thank the you. Event, uh, in the social gathering, I think. So uh, yes. we made a little uh, break in for five minutes for another presentation. 
So you can drink a water, um, drink a coffee, and you be here uh, with the, my my another presentations. So thank you, Owen, and see yes, you. Thank soon. you. Bye.